Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carpet, your host. And with me today is a very special guest, and returning no less, Mr. Matt Germain. How you doing, Matt? Not bad. Yourself? I am doing wonderful, buddy. And it's great having you here because when I want to talk Tampa Bay Rays, you're the guy to go to. You I mean, you look there, you're you're analyzing what's going on with the Sabre metrics. You're looking at all the analytics. You're looking at the teams. You're comparing them everywhere else, and you draw conclusions. And they don't look bad. So so what's happening? Uh, it's, it's a pretty mixed bag of, of things. I mean, you look around at the world, and then you're you're kind of distracted nicely, finally, by baseball, but without yeah. any cost of CBA and everything else. So I'm really appreciative of uh, where the game is right now. Yeah, in the long list of laundry of things, this baseball means nothing, but it is a nice distraction. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you're here to go over it because there's there is a Tampa Bay Rays fan myself. I, I'm always concerned season to season when I see a team that walked off the field after that last postseason game. And yes, postseason, I expect us to be there each year. <laughs> and see them walk off of it there. I, I wonder who's going to be there next year. I wasn't surprised last year when. When I saw Willie Adamas leave us, and uh, I hated to see it, but you know, I think it was the best move for him. But I was a little surprised about Joey Wendell. Yeah, for, you mean for this year, obviously. Yeah. So, so if you look at at uh, Taylor Walls as a, as a player and, and what his abilities are, they're so similar to what uh, Joey Wendell offered, and that includes showing up every day and playing defensively a really tough game so that it, it, it hires up his floor to the point where whatever he gives you offensively speaking is just a bonus right mm-hmm. and, and I think the Rays saw enough in his bat that they were comfortable making that change from Wendell to uh, to Walls and, and that in turn freed up a little bit of money for them to do other things with it and it, it, they still haven't freed up all the money they want to free up but I think they uh, the they were able to bring in, like, for example, somebody like Brooks Raley, which is going to be a very important part of the pen and, and solidify that group. Well, you're, you're talking about emerging players, and I'm looking at Josh Lowe. That's right, Lowe, not Lowe. <laughs> Josh Lowe. <laughs> yeah. And out there in center field, I mean, Kiermaier, I think, was having a little uh, muscular discomfort or something the other day, and Josh was out there even more so, which brings the question to me it's every year. Because everybody likes to poke a finger at, at Kiermaier and says, are we going to keep him again? You know, <laughs> there's people that, that love him and there's people that are like, well, I think he's been here way too long. But but Kiermaier gives it. He brings it to the game. What do you think? You think we're going to continue to have KK with us? I, for as long as the Rays don't get their asking price on him, he will be a Ray. And, and that's because they value him to a certain amount. And if they don't get beyond that, they're better off they're always weighing the trades, right? Like, what are we getting back and what are we giving up? And so when you look at this year's roster in particular, especially now that they brought in Luke Rayleigh, they have six guys that can hit from the left side and play the outfield really well. We saw Vidal Brujan make an, an outstanding diving catch in left field. I think he's going to be an important left field uh, portion of this season coming up if he stays with the team. So when you look at that six left-handed bats in the outfield group, you know that they're not going to roll through the entire season with it. So the question is who, where are they subtracting? Where are they adding? And so if they have as much faith in Luke Rayleigh, as I believe they do, they are going to move Austin Meadows because he is the one yeah. that is the quote unquote defensive liability. Right. And had he learned first base, for instance, and been able to give them another option when he's, you know, getting slotted into the lineup, then it would have been different, but he hasn't done that. And now he's kind of squeezed out of the picture a little bit. Uh, they can keep him. There's no like outstanding pressure where it's like a vice grip, you know, well, we got to get him out of here. Yeah. It's not like that, right? It, it's going to have to make sense when, when they do decide to move him. Um, and, and the other thing is that you still have Brendan Lau as well. So if they, if they do call on one of their infielders to come and play second base, especially the prospects, they've got Jonathan Aranda, they've got Vidal Brujan, they've got a little bit deeper Xavier Edwards, even Miles Mastroboni that you're seeing in spring. They've got a lot of second base op- options. Uh, that then can push Brendan Lau over to the the outfield, and he does an outstanding job out there. I've been surprised with his play even in right field. So they, on the left side, they're just so strong that it only makes sense for them to move one. KK, I feel, belongs in Philadelphia, but they're too stubborn 
to value defense. And we know we, we see that with their corner outfield right now. It's, it's atrocious. The only one that I would rival to them in terms of bad corner out, outfields is the Rockies who just uh, added Chris Bryant and they have Charlie Blackman who's on the downside of his career. So uh, if he could get to either spot, the Rockies or to Philadelphia, I think it would do him and them a world of good, to be honest. Yeah. And I'd like to see KK shine wherever he's at. Just like I said with Willie Adamas, I feel like he's shining so much now with the Brewers. And well, and, and a funny thing too, he's got a friend who's coming there this year who yeah. on first base. And we're talking not about the first baseman, we're talking about Ozzy Timmons. You know, <laughs> and there was a legend almost felt like when Longoria left. I thought this guy is such a part of the franchise. Mm-hmm. I, I hated to see him leave, but it must be a great deal for Ozzy. And I'm, I'm thankful for him. But Wow. <laughs> I'm going to miss all those push-ups. Oh, gosh, yes. And dripping, dropping uh, sunflower seeds on him as he sits there doing a push, what, 10 push-ups, I think, for every uh, run or something. I can't remember the specifics, but wow. I always enjoyed Ozzy out there. He had his own following out there at first base, too. The whole crowd behind there. They were constantly, you know, uh, talking with him. I think they even brought a birthday cake or something to him during one game. So, there's a, a real relationship with him and the fans. And I thought that was great too. So we'll miss Ozzy. <laughs> uh, but well, let's take a look at the lineup though. Uh, 2021, you know, we, we had window out there on third Yandi, I guess there at some of the time we, we did have, uh, we did have Adamas for part of the time. We had Brandon at second uh, yeah. outfield. We had Kiermaier. We had Margot, uh, a Rosarina. And uh, medals first, Yandi and Choi. Uh, who am I forgetting? Oh, catcher, of course, is Unino, whose birthday is today, and uh, Mahia. So, in those critical spots, we know emerging, we're seeing Josh Lowe come up. So, that's potential. We're looking there, and you mentioned Vidal Bruhan as well. I was thinking a year ago, oh my gosh, we got three guys who could come up perhaps to play short stuff. We got Franco, we got Taylor, and even Bruhan could potentially do, do short stuff. So I thought, well, there, there's a crowded little field. Uh, what do you think the lineup is going to look like for 2022? To kick it off, I, I'm guessing, and it's always going to be a guess because they still have you know, a week and a half to make a couple of moves. Um, and I think they still have those in them. Unlike the Jays who've made their, the majority of their moves. I think the Rays are, are still in the planning stages for theirs. Um, and I think Josh Lowe belongs on the roster. To me, he's, he's a rookie of the year candidate. If he gets up in MLB quick enough. And, and I really like where he's at in terms of his at-bats, his speed, what he offers the team. I, I don't think he gets half the credit he does. He should as a prospect. Um, I don't, you can't call him a, a true five tool prospect because the average may take a while to amp up. But I was talking online with, uh, with some people and, and saying, you know, I see his progression basically similar to what uh, uh, Tucker's is in uh, Houston, where he was brought in, he was kind of eased into it, right? Not a full-time yeah. player right away, but eventually grew into that role. And so they can mix and match and see how he's feeling in this, work on things as he goes along. So the, the question then belong, uh, becomes, you know, if he's going to make the roster, then what do you do with the rest? And I think that's the squeeze right now. But on the corners, I see Yandy Diaz and Taylor Walls sharing time at third because their, their splits basically work fairly well together. I mean, Yandy's worked a lot on, on trying to hit left-handers uh, above average grade, and he's just about getting there now. Uh, he's been a reverse split guy for a while before that. So hopefully he continues to build on that. And especially near the end of last year, I thought his bat really came to life and showed the kind of pop that we were hoping he always would have. So if he can start off the year like that, that would be a huge indicator because it changes how the Rays would approach the deadline, right? Um, and so Taylor Walls, if he does that, he can slide all over the place. When Wander Franco needs a day off, you know, you put Taylor Walls at shortstop. That's not really much of a, that's an upgrade defensively. So, and so they have a lot of interchangeable pieces that Kevin Cash can help them keep fresh. On the corners, I mean, for now, you have Randy Rosarena. You have, uh, I'm hoping it'll be Josh Lowe, Brett Phillips, and uh, KK. 
And then the, your guess is as good as mine as to whether or not they keep Emmanuel Margot, yeah. who did an outstanding job for them defensively last year. Just be one of the best, one of the best center fielders in the, in the game, sorry, outfielders. I think there's a spot they could probably find for him somewhere on, on a team, even at 5.6 million. And that reflects, I think it was a 600K upgrade on what MLBTR had, had predicted. And that reflects his defensive play as just being outstanding. I know people are frustrated because they look at his offensive stats and they're like, oh, we wish he was a 2020 guy. When I look around at the teams that could use him, and I know Miami's been looking for a, a center fielder that has some offensive pop, but if they don't find that, that's a spot where he could possibly fit in uh, fairly well. And the same thing with Colorado. Um, but Colorado has a, uh, has a very right-handed heavy lineup. So I don't think they, they're looking for a, le- a right-hander. So possibly they would be more focused in on KK or, or somebody like that. But I don't see that working out because Colorado is not really adding much salary. They're pretty cheap in their own right yeah. overall. So I can't see them taking KK's money on. And I don't see the Rays eating any money. So <laughs> we're at where we're at. Yeah, I, I don't see them. I mean, it was funny looking earlier. Um uh thinking that the Rays actually were talking with Freddie Freeman and I thought, Hmm, that'd be an interesting first baseman to have with a little pop at the plate. So, uh, you know, that didn't work out and then wish him and the Braves well, but, uh, uh, Choi, you know, Choi's become kind of a standard there. He, he seems to be get, keeping himself in fit. I know what from 2020, 2021, he, he dropped a lot of weight, but he, uh, his athleticism was seemed to increase and, the one point I really haven't talked to you about is who's on the mound. Who's going to be there? You know, I mean, we look and I, I see, oh man, wouldn't it be nice to see Richie? No, Richie isn't with us anymore. Okay. You know, okay. Charlie Morton. No, I'm sorry. That was two years ago, Mark. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are the guys, you know, I said, I wish you still had hell, hell. They're old and I'll take the old guys that they seem to be delivering. But this year, you know, we, we look at our injury list and we kept hoping that maybe Tyler would be back, but it doesn't look like that's going to be part of the game this year either. So what have we got for pitching with the Rays? What's happening, Matt? Uh, well, the good news for Rays fans is that if you focus on the fact that the Rays split their innings 50-50 between the relievers and the starters, historically, the last two or three years, that means that they have an extremely dominant second half because their pen is looking like it's going to be elite and very deep. So that's covered, essentially. Uh, Sure, they could look for a closer to kind of finish it off if they wanted to, but it'd be a luxury of of riches, basically. On on the starter side, they're hoping a few guys will come in as stabilizers. So Corey Kluber, if if they're able to keep him at four or five innings per start through the entire season, that's a stabilizer. The one guy that can give the pen a a good rest will be Shane McClanahan. So they've got that one guy that can kind of go out there and put in six innings plus every time. And they'll be satisfied with that. And his innings are able to go somewhere around 160 to 165, just over what Ryan Yarbrough led the staff with last year. Right. And that's the next guy who's a stabilizer as well, which I still love. But I know a lot of people are kind of, wishy-washy with whether or not they should you know cheer for him as hard as they should since 2018 he's in the top 30s in terms of innings pitched and he has is in the top 20 something for uh in terms of whip over that span so he's doing his job overall over the last four years it's just a matter of last year taking a step back and having some rough starts that really made it uh ugly for a lot of fans and frustrated them. And I don't think he was happy with his consistency either. So hopefully he returns to consistency and gives them a more stable middle of the rotation. So then you look at the young guys at the back and you've got Drew Rasmussen, you've got uh, Louis Patino who will fill that out first. Uh, Patino supposedly had a little hiccup and now he's supposed to be okay. We'll see if that holds up. But both of those guys can benefit a lot from Corey Kluber. Kluber's got the mixed bag of tricks, right? So he can help them grow their stuff, give them little tweaks here and there and give them that mental state of mind where, okay, like I should have confidence in this. I should have confidence in that, yada, yada, yada. And if they're able to get those two guys to have a third pitch they can consistently lean on, and it has to do with speed, in my opinion. If they're able to change the speeds, because both of them can, 
can dial it up and, and have really good stuff overall, but they need to be able to trick the, the hitters a little bit more and to get them thinking about speed changes. If they can manage that, they'll be elite back enders in terms of when you compare them to the elites. And then you have Shane Boz, who's having a, a little cleanup happening, which is actually a benefit because the timing's perfect. Blake Snell did the exact same thing in 2019, I believe. And, and he, he waited until after the All-Star break to do it. And that was just too late. So it ended up eating up a whole bunch of the season. And then when he came back, he was elite, like even yeah. twice more elite than he was beforehand. So if you've got something like that going on, now's the time. It limits the innings that he's going to be asked to do overall, which is probably a benefit to everyone anyway. So they'll be able to ease him in and hopefully he comes in mid to end May and becomes that elite add in to whoever they need to change out of the rotation. And today's starter, Josh Fleming, is that spot guys that you need uh, innings here, innings there at the beginning. And then behind him in AAA, you've got Chris Matza, Aaron Sledgers, and, and a bunch of others who have the similar kind of experience as well if they need to draw on that. So in, in, I'm comfortable with where they're at. Am I extremely confident in saying this is an elite rotation right now? No. But do I see the progress towards one? Yes, I, I see that. And then on top of it, we've heard that the Rays are in on Frankie Montas. If they get Frankie Montas, depending on what they're giving up and getting back, there's a chance that they would have the best rotation in the AL East. And I know people will point to the Jays. To me, they took out the Cy Young winner and they, they put in a guy who wasn't even made an offer by the Giants. To me, that says a lot. They gave him a hell of a lot of money for seven years. So they better hope it pans out. But I, I see them, like, I see the risks in Toronto's um, rotation for a couple of reasons. Nate Pearson hasn't really shown that he's the depth guy that they need if something goes wrong with another guy. And then you've got Ryu, who has a ton of innings on his own uh, arm, and he's going to be 36 this year. So to me, that's two little indications that things could go sideways a little bit for them and then put pressure on them to make more moves and their system's pretty thin. Yeah. Yeah. With Robbie right. re leaving, you know, I thought, well, I thought maybe they'd keep him, but you know, no. So uh, <laughs> we're talking about the blue Jays. You would, in looking back though, jumping back who I, some of the guys I really want to see on the mound for the race. One, see Andrew Kittredge back up there, you know, seeing what he can do. And I think he's, he's still there. Uh, who is it? It was Nick Anderson. Nick Anderson's the guy I think who's, who's injured, but Nick, Nick was always, he's fun to watch, man. He has that killer attitude on the mound. And that's a player I, I really enjoy seeing. Um, I think you're going to enjoy watching Jalen Beats come back. Yep. He looked really good in his spring uh, outing just recently. And, and if they get him and, and Colin Pache back, and the, the eliteness coming out of that pen is just ridiculous and different looks too for all of them. You know, like it's spring training still boys and girls. It's a couple of weeks away from opening day. And I had the good fortune to go down to Port Charlotte uh, about a week or so ago. Well, a week ago, could have been more than that. And uh, man, it was something it, it's, this is an exciting time. I always talk about with Brandon when he's here, it's like, yeah, you can't really get, count much of what's going on with spring training. Cause you got a lot of guys, that you're, you're going to be able to see right now, maybe double A, triple A, that they're going to be, this is their opportunity to, to show and shine across major league players in the league. So you get to see that, but you also get to see your own players and maybe they're a little more re relaxed, but it is interesting. It's a great time to see players. And you mentioned the Jays a minute ago, and it made me think about something else that's going on. And that's vaccinations. And I'm not, I'm not going to proselytize here. I've already said what I had to say about this. And if you haven't done it, you should, but <laughs> so much for not proselytizing. The, the thing of it is I've been watching and I say, well, right now, if you're going to play in the regular season with Toronto and you're going to head up there, you better be vaccinated. So uh, what NYC, New York city came out and I said, I think it was today and said, Oh, you know what? It's okay. We're going to go ahead and let Kylie Irving play out there in NBA. We're going to go ahead and let Aaron Judge and the others who have not been vaccinated, they're going to go out. They're going to be able to play. However, however, when Mr. Aaron Judge goes Toronto, that's not going to be something he can do. I, I wonder if, will he be on the IL? Will, will they dock his pay for those games? I don't know. I don't know, but it's a little ridiculous, to be honest. You're a grown man. Get, get your vaccination. There's five-year-olds in line, like – Grow a pair. Like, honestly, <laughs> I just, honestly, it's ridiculous. 
You're a grown ass man. Get vaccinated. There you go, bro. End the story. <laughs> well, you know, and there's folks who are maybe have to be motivated by money, money. And that seemed to be the case with Trevor Story signing with the Red Sox the other day. It was like, okay, we got everything done, Trevor. Oh, and by the way, you got to get vaccinated. Really? You're going to give me all this money? Yeah. Okay, I'll send and I'll get the vaccination. <laughs> so come on, like like you said, just step up, boys and girls. Be it's it's not going to kill you. I promise. You get that vaccine before you go into school for measles or whatever else to boot. So this should just be one more thing to check Zero. off the list. Zero sympathy <laughs> people. I really don't. Uh, oh man, you know. <laughs> anyway, but. Oh <laughs> You, you know, you were talking a moment ago about spring training, and I think you maybe even posted something this on, on your uh, Twitter account, which is at underscore Matt, M-A-T underscore Jermaine. Did I get this right? G-E-R-M-A-I-N underscores or two or three underscores. Like, I forget. It's two underscores. Two. Yeah. So it's at Matt underscore Jermaine underscore. Okay, folks, if you haven't been following him, you need to, and that's where you start. But looking at some of the things you had on there, I don't know, if it, was it you or somebody else who put up something about Beckham, though, like Tim Beckham, an old <laughs> Ray. <laughs> and he was out there playing against the other day. And you want to tell him what, what, what happened with Tim? So Tim you hit a pretty big home run and, and decided to, uh, to look into the dugout and, and kind of stare down the Rays, which is ridiculous. There's, there's three guys that are still there from when he played with the Rays. And it, nobody would even know what he's talking about. <laughs> he was traded for Tobias Myers. So we still have junior Caminero, I think his name is, that, that came back from Myers in, in the, the Guardians deal. But I put up a tweet afterwards that just pointed out that the Rays upgraded from Tim Beckham to Willie Adamas. And then they upgraded from Willie Adamas to Wander Franco. I don't think you would ever see Willie Adamas, unless it was just for fun, like out of humor, to, to look into the dugout if he if he hit a big home run against the Rays. Like, honestly, he would be loved. He'd be giving guys hugs on the way back. You know what I mean? And that's the way, you know, the Rays are built. And to me, he represents the old guard. And that's what Neander got rid of when he first came in as GM. He got rid of the old guard of, of Rays that kind of had this chip on their shoulder about everything, you know, depending on whether or not you were playing, how much you were playing, you know, how much glory you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, he tossed all that aside and he gave the team to Kevin Cash. And Cash made the decisions from then on and he led the race afterwards. So it, it's kind of interesting to see him pimp a home run in spring training <laughs> and just go off like that. It just <laughs> it rubs you the wrong way a little bit. Oh, yeah. I, I guess I'm just so inured by it all anymore. Just like, oh, come on, really, Tim? But yeah. it, to, to the point of ridiculousness, because like, as you pointed out, when he looks there into that dugout of the race, maybe there's two or three guys that, <laughs> that were there when he was there. But that's part of the fun of spring training. It's like, yeah, we, we don't always count what's what's going on with that. But uh, another thing you posted was the Pocota ratings, you know, right. and saying, hmm, here's what we say from all these saber metrics where the Rays will be at the end of the year. And they've, they've done so well the last couple of years in their measurements on the race, didn't they? <laughs> oh, every year, it's a frustration of mine. And it's okay. Like, I get it. I, and the players know. The Rays players know. They've Brendan Lau uh, mentioned it during an interview recently where he's like, we know we're always going to be the underdogs. You're never going to give us credit. Some analysts have kind of crossed over. And, and even Mad Dog on Mad Dog Radio, I heard the other day, give praise to the Rays. And he's finally crossed that line that says, okay, I can give them some respect now. So they just, you know what? Those ratings are really, really, really terrible at measuring <laughs> speed, defense, front office, managing, and prospect depth. Those five things, it has absolutely no idea how to quantify them. And to me, that's, that's something that you should be able to work into a, a system, right? Like right now, the Blue Jays, should get a step back on their rating because of their lack of depth. But it'll never do that. It'll look at the names on the roster and say, oh, well, this is what they're going to have the entire year. <laughs> and so we're going to give them this grade. Well, no, you can't do that. So it's kind of interesting the way they work out. I think I've, because I focus so much on the race, I've been fairly accurate in my, my predictions year to year. So it's a frustration of mine in terms of seeing that year after year after year is just like, 
at some point you have to realize that your system is broken. Get the shovel out and bury it because it, it don't work. And, but I don't know, brother, it, it, it is interesting. And too, I mean, I'm looking, you posted something as well uh, recently on the speed of the race. I mean, uh, anybody who's been watching them at all over the last few years, if you knew nothing else, you knew Randy Rosarina with his speed and ability to still face it. So give us a little bit more than just the Randy depth on that. Right. So you're adding three guys with uh, a grade of uh, 55 or better. And Taylor Walls is a 55. Josh Lowe is, is a 60. But really, when it comes to stealing bases, he should be a 70. He never gets caught. He, he's very smart in terms of how he steals bases and when he steals them. And then uh, Vidal Bruhan's an automatic 70 grade. So between those three guys, they're adding such great base running skills and speed. And that applies to range and defensively as well, right? But just in, in the base running, being able to go first to third or first to home, they're, they're adding a bunch of those guys that are able to do that. And even Luke Rayleigh, who moves really well, he's a 50 grade. So it's just about average, maybe a tad Tidge bit over average. So they're adding a bunch of speed. And th those guys, if they do end up trading Meadows and, and a couple of other guys, it should be a boon to them in the season of being able to scratch in a few more runs against some of those big teams and, uh, and actually come up with a few more wins against the big boys. So uh, hopefully it serves them well. And I, I historically it has. So yeah, they know how to use it. Well, and it's a big part of the excitement of the game for me. I mean, if somebody's stealing a base or even if they're just kind of jumping back and forth, and, hey, 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 pitcher, I'm, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go to second. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make sure you don't focus on what you're trying to do at bat. <laughs> or, or they're on second base and doing it. Rosary has always been fun to watch. Kiermaier has been fun watching his speed. But uh, you're talking about the speed. One more thing that's going to be interesting, too, is – the new rule of allowing a larger base rule not, is not the word, but the implementation of, of something on the field of having a larger base. So I guess maybe you can get to it a little closer. And maybe you won't run into that first baseman and, and, and knock him down as much. Right. They're doing that in the minors first. I don't think they're applying it this year and it's for next year, possibly putting oh, it in. Okay. So it's going to be, it's going to make basically second base 4.5 inches closer. And Brett Phillips was talking about that recently where he said, yeah, he goes, most times when I think back to all the times I was caught stealing, it was that close of a range. Yeah. So he said, you know, generally for the raise, it's going to, <laughs> you're, you're gonna, you might see some records broken <laughs> if they end up with Greg Jones and all those guys arriving at the same time. <laughs> Woo, look out <laughs> the raise. Every single is a double. <laughs> Wow, it might even be a triple in some in some cases, right? So, uh, yeah, that's significant. I don't know if they're making home plate bigger. I, they haven't I mentioned that. No, I, I didn't hear that either. I, I, I was curious about that, so we'll, we'll see what comes with it. But I, I just heard the bases, and I thought, well, you know, maybe it, it makes less collisions too, and yeah. uh, maybe a little less exciting at home plate, but less collisions. We had Nick Gordo here earlier this week and talking about the Red Sox. And you know he's excited as well as you might imagine. Yep. Yeah, uh, very dangerous team. Very yeah. dangerous. Yes, they get the pitching they need, and whew, look out. Yeah, Heim Bloom. You know he opened the wallet a little bit. I guess he, they might actually go over the luxury tax limit for the year, which is yeah. I would never have guessed. <laughs> and I've done that before. They yeah, won the year they won the World Series, they're up around two forty. But they brought High and Bloom in with a raise attitude, I thought, which is usually very budget conscious. And and when they got rid of Mookie Betts, you know, I was like, eh, we'll see. But yeah, they're they're more winning conscious than anything, I guess. That's what's going to come through with the fans. But another thing, just you and I, nobody's listening to this. <laughs> what what seriously? What what is the uh, what is your take on the AL East at this moment for 2022? So because the Rays, I feel, have the, have the most elite pen and the tools to keep their floor the highest, and they have the system to tap into, whether it is to use guys or to trade for other pieces, and they know each other well, they've been there before, they've been in tight games, they're the same group coming back aside from one, I have to give the Rays the top spot, and I don't care what anybody says. To me, I'm told somebody dethrones them, they are it. On the lesser defensive side, right, they have... If George Springer plays the entire year and he's actually able to run like he used to, which at 32 with all the injuries he has, especially in the abdominal area, that's a tough thing to call on, right? 
Uh, so one dive can change everything for their season. Um, so that's where it scares me on the Blue Jays side. And I think if you look at, at Guerrero's away splits and his splits in the second half, they point to a little bit of a downgrade on what he did last year. They traded away, uh, trade away. They lost Semyon in free agency, which is a huge piece of their offense and their spirit, their everyday fighting spirit. Now, Matt Chapman is no chum, but he's not an average guy. He's also he's he's a bit more of a a Yankees bomber style player, right? Where he'll give he won't give you high average, but he'll give you some big home runs, which is great. And it'll give you that defensive value, which they've been needing at third base for a long time. But the guy for me that, that could push them over the top would be Gabriel Moreno. He's their uh, their top prospect, and he's a catcher, and he's so elite. Like when we when they get him in their lineup with those guys, it's going to be really big trouble for the Rays. But they're not doing that right away. They have a stable rotation, so they'll be there. To me, they're second place. The Yankees are toying and they're doing the right things in terms of getting more athletic, uh, but they still have that cog in the middle, which will always be injury prone. Their lead guys like LeMahieu and whatnot are starting to get older. And with that, they're getting a little bit slower. So their range defensively isn't necessarily going to be there. Their catching defensively is going to be a lot better. So their staff should improve a little bit, but I still don't trust their starters at all. To me, they're going to be using young guys, so that increases the volatility. So to me, they're either a third or fourth place team, depending on which of them or the Red Sox have the pitching come through. Yeah. Uh, but when I look at the pens, because of the, the latest additions that the Red Sox have made, I actually give them an edge over the Yankees. And I think the Yankees overused their pen last year, depended on it a lot. And Chapman's showing cracks. A couple of other guys are showing cracks. So I'm putting the Yankees fourth unless they make significant moves in season to change that. Wow. Well, we know where the Orioles are. So. Yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> say, so, you know, there's something about just having to rub elbows with uh, number five that has to hurt. <laughs> and God bless those Oriole fans. I, I, I can't imagine. I love to go visit Camden Yards. I just I just have a hard time being a fan, I think, there. And, but uh, it's it's going to be an exciting year, man. I'm I'm really excited about the Rays this year. I'm looking forward to it. Looking to our two-time all uh, what uh, manager of the year, Mr. Kevin Cash. You know, it's it's a lot of good things ahead. Just for the record, I have four teams in the AL East making the playoffs this year. <laughs> four. Well, we four. know who. It, oh, wow, brother. Well, we know you who know, it is. The isn't. other teams I have making the playoffs are the White Sox in the Central and the Mariners in the West. Wow. All the other ones. Man, I'm going to hold you that because I'm excited about that with the, the new the playoffs. I'm not crazy about the larger playoffs, but it would, man, that would be crazy interesting if that was the case. So it I almost, hope you're right. It almost happened last year. Yeah. The Jays were one win away from making it happen. That's true. Yeah. So. That's true. Well, brother, uh, Matt Germain voicing you. Uh, Matt Germain visiting us here today <laughs> on Baseball's Biz. And Matt, it's always a pleasure having you here and you know, sharing your expertise and not just that, the fandom of the Rays and all things baseball. And if folks, again, if you haven't looked him up, you should. That's Matt, M-A-T underscore Germain, G-E-R-M-A-I-N underscore. And that is the Twitter handle for Matt. He's got plenty to say and share. And he's also, uh, what, becoming an enthusiast in soccer as well, MLS, aren't you? Yep. Yeah, I've been following just starting and and because Canada is ramping things up towards the World Cup appearance, it looks like. Uh, and the fact that baseball was threatening the, <laughs> the strike uh, or, you know, a prolonged lockout. Yeah. I decided to tap into it a little bit and kind of pay attention more to it than I did before. But to be quite honest, the, the acting is getting under my, uh, getting <laughs> on my nerves. Like the whole falling down and being, you know, I just got shot. To me, you should be out for 10 minutes if that happens. You know, <laughs> regardless of what state you're in when you stop crawling around. You should be on the sidelines for 10 minutes. It can put in another player for you, but you're, you know, it's just ridiculous. You, you want to take the professional wrestling attitude out of yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's down. He had a win last night. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, brother. Well, man, thanks once again, buddy, for joining us here as Baseball Biz. I look forward to talking with you again real soon. Sounds good, man. Anytime. All right. You've been listening to Baseball Biz. As always, you can find us on your favorite podcast directory, including Apple Podcasts, 
Google Up Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and more. Thanks again. And remember, you can also check us out on Twitter at TheBaseballBiz. Take care and have a great week. Special thanks to XTake RUX for the music rocking forward. <laughs>